Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm Kevin Strike here with Alex Beddows. Hey, mom. Hey, so um, yeah, we're we're quite ahead of schedule in the right now. Uh, we recorded this episode a long time ago, back in uh, in 2020, and now we're recording this overview. Still, probably a few months before it goes live. Um, COVID is still like around, and I don't know when I will be getting the vaccine. Is so far ahead. Maybe maybe we'll even actually be dead by the time this comes out. <laughs> Dude, you, you joke about that. I, you know what? We're like the human race is like cockroaches. We, uh, I was watching a documentary yesterday about like every like mass extinction event that took place and like whether we'd survive. And he basically summarizes like we'd be able to wipe out like large portions of population with all these like extinction events, but yeah. We would be able to eradicate. We wouldn't have an, an actual extinction event. Like you said, we like, would find a way to survive, like nuclear winters, solar winters, like global warming. Like it would affect a lot of people, but wiping us out, yeah, it's difficult. If it could be difficult, I was like, I don't know whether to take that as a pessimistic response or an optimistic response. We're like cockroaches. I was like, that. I think there's a compliment somewhere in there. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, hopefully we are still alive. Um, and. This was uh, a really fun episode to do with Kim Ava. Uh, you've worked with her before. You know her. For those that don't, um, maybe you could say a few words. Yeah, Kim's great. She's uh, she's a lead 3D artist, and she's actually she's both a lead and a principal artist at uh, EA Dice. Um, she has a really good Twitch stream as well, where she kind of um, tackles new things and learns new things on stream with people. To and it it's you know it's very helpful actually. You know it's very good for those trying to get into the industry seeing a professional kind of humble themselves and be okay learning and she's learned all sorts of stuff um substance design now programming and she's done all on stream and it's it's yeah it's very it's a really useful resource i know i've followed streamers in the past who are like that who are industry people learning and doing stuff on stream because you kind of see that oh, they're human and they have to go through the same processes and the pains I have to when I'm trying to, you know, learn and get into the industry. So she's a very inspiring person, like, and mm -hmm. also one of the few artists who is extremely proficient at both stylized art and realism. I mean, she's working on Battlefield franchise, which is, you know, as realistic as it gets, but yet yeah, can still put, churn out, like, really good stylized props. So she's kind of like a, a jack of all trades in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, fun to talk to her about that. And it's true what you say about her t Twitch streams uh, being uh, interesting to watch. Uh, we talked about uh, some other things within the games industry as well that uh, I remember um, we really enjoyed. Yeah, it's um, it is a funny topic. We, we didn't expect to actually talk about this, but it was kind of... Um, well, I was asking about, you know, the whole being a, both a lead artist and a principal artist. And it led us on to this conversation of um, just how, if you're a student trying to get into the industry, how confusing it is with these job titles. You know, like a lead in one studio is completely different to a lead in another studio. And like the, a junior in one studio is different to what's one in the other and tech artist. And there's all these job titles, which you hear, but they all have like different meanings depending on where you are in the world and what studio you're on and the time within the production like the it was a it's very confused it, for someone like us who are in the industry we find it confusing to keep track of so i'm like oh god imagine if you're a student trying to keep on top of all this like it's very confusing mm -hmm. all right so uh that's enough uh for our conversation um we hope you enjoy the uh, <laughs> messed up that little part <laughs> all right uh sounds good so we hope you enjoy the conversation Hi, Kim. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I, I, I need to just interject. I, I need to ask a question. Um, so, Kim, I know we've spoken before in the past. I was browsing your art station today and I like, noticed something, um, which I haven't seen before, which is you hold the title of lead artist and principal artist. Um, so, I'm correct in saying that, you're, that you do hold them two titles at, at DICE. Yeah, I uh, do have both titles. Like that's because I do two different type of job at the same time. I would say, like, and uh, in my case particular, I'm working with a team where, like, I can juggle both roles, and like that, the work I do is like kind of inter, you know, intermixing into my daily work tasks. And I guess it's kind of like it, it's almost like the old school leads, like the old school lead title before they split. The lead into both you know a manager type role and a principal artist it's essentially that right and i mean it's quite a good thing actually that they, that they say they acknowledge the fact that they are 
two different jobs and you're just doing both of them. It's quite cool to see. Yeah, and like it is like you said, it's probably the old school. Like it depends probably on who you ask and for what studio they've been working on, you know, as well, because that's always going to be different what a lead and a principal artist is doing. But it's true that most times like a lead is more a manager or like overseer of a project or a particular workflow or some kind of task force or something like that. You have a, like a group of people that you manage and make sure that they do know what's coming and the, their deadlines and just in general uh, be this person in between producers and artists. And uh, most times like a principal in most studios are, um, I guess I heard this phrase, uh, phrase at least that it's a very, one of the very best in the industry, you know, working on the coolest props or and stuff like that. But I also heard that in some studios, a principal is more of a person who dictates uh, workflow and pipelines for the rest of the team. And that's why that role is also one of my responsibilities, because the team I'm working with, the centralized units, is dictating a lot of the workflows and what softwares and tools we're going to use and how we build things. So it's like a natural... Um, mix then to have the lead and to have the principal role at the same time it, it's quite funny you're, having to, you're doing what every artist in the games industry has to do most studios most studios because the fact of the matter is i guess the games industry has no clear boundaries on titles like we said you know a principal artist in one studio is a completely different thing to another studio and that does pose problems because i guess i can imagine as a student like coming in now and you go okay so what do you want to be an environment artist <laughs> doesn't really mean much because there's like six subtitles to an environment artist. Like, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to explain sometimes because when people ask, like, where you work at right now, I want to be an environment artist. I'm like, okay, but we don't really necessarily have that role because it's divided differently. And then they're like, oh, but so what? what is, uh, what would that be at your studio? And then it's like, well, it depends on what you want to do. It's... You know, it's it might be uh, completely different. Like most times when people ask that, I would say like at our studio, that would be more of a level artist than a environment artist. And then they're like, okay, but what is the rest the, the rest of the environment artist doing then? And then it's like, well, that's more of a prop artist building the building blocks while the level artist is placing the building blocks and so on. So uh, it's not just like environment artists. Uh, it's like every role that's going to be different. So I think whenever you are applying for a job, it's going to be sometimes hard to know if your set of skills is applicable or if it's even the same thing as what you think in your head that you're looking for. So it might see if, you know, a title, but it doesn't necessarily mean what you have in your head and that's the type of work you want to do. So that also makes it hard for talent acquisitions or just in general people who are recruiting because they see a certain type of title and then they try to apply that when they're looking for people on their studio but since they're not always involved in you know the project itself it's quite hard to know then for them as well like what type of skill set does the people have that are applying for the role or they are looking for so i think in general it's confusing for everyone it's hard to explain what a role you know what you're supposed to do in your role but then also uh, for people in recruiting to find the right people because, oh, it's so many times that I get like LinkedIn requests for being, uh, you know, something that I'm like, yeah, I'm not really doing that. Or, yeah. oh, can you work like uh, a character artist? Because we can see that you're a 3D generalist. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not working with characters. And so, you know, it can be very hard in general. I think uh, the game scene industry should kind of set together some kind of you know key key roles that are the mm. same across studios so when you're hiring um for your team are you do, do you find yourself then creating uh, a list of responsibilities that seem unique each time mm, that can be a tricky one because it depends on what skill set you're looking for sometimes you might be looking for a certain type of skill set compared to you know, just the role. I would say like looking for a role is then that you're more generally trying to fill 
uh, a headcount for something while looking for specific skills, then you might have to tailor titles or specifics in there. And that can also be hard to pinpoint what you actually need right now and what you need in the future. So, but still trying to keep it the same as what you already have established in the studio. Um, but yeah, it's not easy when you're interviewing people either to try to find a common ground. You have to specifically ask like, what did you do in your role? Uh, rather than like, you know, just a general title because that role that they had might be exactly what you're looking for in skills, but sound completely different on paper. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the main thing I've, I've spent like early on before COVID shut down everything, going to like universities and talking to them. And it's kind of like the main thing I've always felt like from the education point of view is this is what the edu for me, what higher education is all about is informing people about the possibilities, not necessarily the hard skills. I feel like hard skills you, you learn in your own time quite a lot, but you should be made aware of or help develop a career plan. Like it should be, okay, mm -hmm. where do you want to work? Okay, you want to work as a, a cloud Imperium, which is a hard surface workflow. Okay, you need to research face where normal workflows and all these kind of things. I mean, to, and actually speaking of that, I feel like from just speaking to the community in general, the Scandinavian countries, Sweden in particular, are doing a great job in bettering higher education. Um, and I believe it's like scheme set up where it can help you know, students from universities in in go from you know directly from university into studios. But what other things, just on in your experience as a lead and you know talking about these these sorts of topics, do you think education systems can do better? Because we can always improve. Everything can always get better. So is there anything like you've noticed when you're hiring people when you're speaking to students that so you're like, I wish they were taught this earlier on, or I wish they knew this earlier on? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And I think that's always also going to change depending on like what's new in the industry. So sometimes a lot of changes happen quite quickly, too quickly for like education system to also, you know, catch, catch up with what's happening. So it might sometimes be a long time or, you know, a delay in changing educational plans and so on. So on. Um, but in particular, what I notice is that most, at least game art educations are very focused on art itself, like that it needs to look good and that it needs to look like amazing when you post it on say art station, um, which is like very eye catching uh, pieces. And, you know, a lot of people are very skilled. A lot of students are very skilled, but when you do then look at potential like interns uh, or juniors, one thing that is in common is the, the lack of technical skills. And since we are getting a lot of more automation and proceduralism and, you know, things are getting easier to do, like it's easier to understand and a lot of things are automated, you need a higher technical understanding even within art. And I think that is something that is usually lacking the the key of understanding uh, technical execution and in particular because we're making games we still have limitations and usually those things are something we have to teach uh, students when they come to the workplace that you could kind of have wished that they already knew uh, how to optimize for a game uh, rather than just making something pretty um, because otherwise you could you know, work with movies or something that doesn't really require that type of optimization. And even in bigger game studios that are doing AAA games, we're not like implementing uh, a Sabre sculpt into the engine and needs some kind of optimization, you know, before that happens. And you have to be smart with your UVs and you have to have the LODs and, you know, why you're doing certain things. So, um, yeah. That is something that is usually lacking and it's common even, you know, outside of Swedish education, uh, when I've seen students uh, asking for feedback in general and, you know, internet and stuff. Um, it's interesting also that you men mentioned Sweden, you know, higher education. I think something that is very popular here in Sweden is to do uh, vocational education. So it's after high school, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you did get a bachelor or a degree in something. You get a diploma that you have finished a after high school education, but it doesn't ne necessarily mean that much. It's more like a gateway into the industry because most uh, studios 
have some kind of collaboration with the vocational education so that they take a set of interns. Um, I think it's like either autumn or spring. So in that way, they also have like already included in the education that they're doing an internship while still in universities uh, or college in Sweden, they don't have that included in the education. So it's still a bit harder to get an internship or a junior position after the education is finished. So that's why it's very popular to take the vocational one because it's already part of your education uh, to be in a studio. I, it's, it's funny because you say we, you know, the, the universities or higher education can't roll with the times quick enough. It's funny though, because for me, I feel like it's the wrong way around. I feel like it's you, the technical stuff, optimization, LODs, that's not changing anytime soon. That's been the same for the past, what, nearly 15 years. It's the kind of stuff that you should be teaching, the technical stuff. The new flashy software or like, you know, hard skills, um, whether that's Houdini, Substance Designer, Blender, whatever it might be. I kind of feel like it's that stuff you should be learning in your own time because there's just not enough hours in a day. Like a, a university cannot teach every aspect of an environment art between the nine to fives. Or not even, it's not even nine to five. But what they can teach are principles. They can teach you what good top, uh, topology looks like. They can teach you what um, textual density is and all these technical things. And, but it feels like it's the other way around. It, it feels like at the moment, at least in the UK, I'm observing is that they try to cram all these hard skills into you without considering the fact that they're not really showing the implementation of these skills. Mm. Um, and that you can roll with. Like, you know, like we said, co collision and lots hasn't changed in nearly 20 years. So it's not hard for you to stay on, on top of that. It's just not fun is the problem. It's a, it's a good point because it hasn't really changed. What has changed is maybe, you know, the limitations of it that, you know, I have a little bit more freedom or more span room like you know with all of the things that you need and that you can probably cram cramp in a little bit more um but it's indeed that uh, education try to focus on like oh the cool and flashy thing is now say substance and then everyone is doing substance design and materials and everyone wants to show that they can make a material from scratch uh, without using any type of bitmaps and i'm like that's very inefficient. Like, why, why would I do that? Uh, why would I even let anyone in my team sit and spend hours and hours? Like, it's fun and it's cool, but that's not going to yield the same result. If you want to do a photorealistic game, then it's better to use the power of having the non-destructive workflow of mixing, uh, like, scan data in uh, Substance Designer uh, and use that powerful, like, that you can have... Uh, endless of variation instead of trying to go from scratch um, and spending the time there. Um, but it's a lot of the times that students are showing like, hey, I made this entirely from scratch. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I mean, that's really cool, but what, what am I supposed to do with it? Like, do you know that you can mix materials that are photo scanned? And they're like, oh, I never thought about that. It's like, maybe they should have thought about teaching students that part and that you don't have to spend hours uh, doing your own materials from scratch. Uh, so yeah, I I am very involved with uh, education and I'm trying to talk to students about like what we want to see. But I also think, um, you know, you're competing a lot with others out there on the internet. And I think a lot of people are also afraid that they won't get clicks or the attention or enough likes if they don't have the most cool and flashy things. And then you also tend to forget all of the parts to actually make up, uh, you know, a game. And it's also like very much a team effort, but it's a lot of people focusing on that. Oh, I did this entirely by myself. So um, I think there's a disconnect there. Um, you always rather ha hire a team player than the, the one that has the flashiest uh, portfolio as well. So when you bring somebody into the team, you, you know they're lacking in certain s skills, but you you brought them on probably because they uh, you, you see, like as you mentioned, they would be a good team player. Are there specific ways that you go about uh, teaching or resources you point to or exercises you give to help develop the artist? 
Well, I can only talk about what like myself and my team has been doing. Uh, not necessarily the same in all workplaces or the same in even, you know, the same company on a different team. But in my team, we always make sure that uh, they get a mentor or even two that help them out with like onboarding into studio culture, into like how we work in soft skills. And, you know, we all know that they can use regular tools, but if they don't know how to use Maya and that's what we're using, then we will give them time to learn. And there are internal resources uh, on how we work as well. So uh, the key is always to have a good relationship with your mentor and checkups like all the time. And we also make sure that the students or the interns then um, set up goals and also um, just get into the culture that it's okay to fail and we're not expecting anyone to deliver from the first day. Like we dedicate like specifically like uh, a set of weeks or even months for just the person to get into how we're working. And then it's a bonus if, uh, you know, you you do produce, like we want to make sure that you produce for uh, one of our games, but it shouldn't be... Uh, on the account of that it's affecting your mental health because you feel stressed or that you feel that you are not good enough or not delivering it. Like the key for an intern for me is always to learn and get a valuable experience uh, that they can, you know, bring in their baggage with uh, other knowledge. So um, that's usually how we, you know, in broad, broad sentences, uh, how we onboard someone as an intern. I guess you've got other resources too. I mean, okay, anyone who's ever heard me speak knows I am a big advocate of learning communities, micro communities. Um, I mean, I know you have one yourself. You you Twitch stream and you have like a Discord where people can go and um, hang out and talk to each other. I feel as if these are, it's kind of like the modern day poly count, but it's like, the, this is where you get to speak to people and ha speak the same language. Because as artists, we speak a certain language. We use certain words, which not everyone understands. If I walk to a random person in the street and say, hey, like these normal maps look a bit weird, they'd look at me like I'm a crazy person. Whereas if I speak to you as a 3D artist and I say, hey, the normal map looks a bit weird, you know what I'm referring to. And in these communities, I feel like that's where you grow a lot of these skills. Like you get to see artists in real time, especially yourself when you Twitch stream. Let's say I know that the Jeremy Estrelado does it too. Watching a professional work in real time is probably one of the most useful learning experiences you'll see because a lot of times we see the highlight reels of people. We see either tutorials be made where it's scripted A to B or we see their portfolios and it's all the flashy great stuff. When we watch you work in real time, it's like, oh, you make mistakes, you struggle, you hit walls, you don't finish things because you can't figure out a solution. These are like, this is the modern day learning to me is these Discord communities or like, my, oh, sorry, but a better word is micro communities are a really good way to learn these days. Like I, I push everyone towards them. But for you, what have you noticed? Like, have you seen any trends within your own, like that people have really benefited from or like you know, certain things happen? Well, I always get the comments that the fact that people, like the thing people like the most with my streams is that I'm they feel like I'm a normal human being, you know, a person uh, and not someone who's just, you know, flashy big name in the industry that they can actually see someone, oh yeah, she also has struggles. And, you know, one of the best things I know uh, doing on stream is learning something new and then showing people that, yeah, you know, I don't get it the first time, nor the second or the third or the fourth. Like it takes a long time for me to actually learn things myself and that I kind of need to, attack it from different angles or it won't stick. Like I am so bad at memorizing things as well. Um, so that that's one of the things that I hear from people that it takes away the pressure from them. No, like it feels more that, oh, it's regular people working in the industry. Um, so for me, it feels like at least, you know, the small community then that I have myself that it's more getting relaxed, like a relaxed atmosphere. It feels also that people can open up more and they dare to show their things and also talk about uh, and ask questions because otherwise uh, I also heard that people feel that their questions are stupid just because they are new, but that's like the thing you will never learn if you're not asking questions, right? And no questions are stupid. So in these small communities then I feel that people get comfortable enough to actually, you know, 
just chat and hang out and talk about things that they don't understand in a more um, natural way than in other settings. And I myself hang, you know, a lot of the time when I was a student on Polycount, that was my learning resource. It was like the best thing ever. Like whatever I had a question, I wouldn't really dare to ask uh, people around me because I didn't want to be judged. But on the internet, I could be like, hey, I have this issue. And you would get way better response on the forum because there are so many different people hanging out there rather than like the classmates that I had or one teacher. So yeah, that I miss Polycount in a way now that it's not the same uh, nowadays that it was before, but it's like you said, a lot of these things have moved to uh, Discord or Twitch and stuff instead. Um, and I hope that it continues, you know, being an open space that people can seek uh, knowledge or just get to, get to know people better and find uh, other like-minded people. So that that's the interesting bit that I, I quite like is the fact that you can find something that works for you because every community i don't know how much time you spend in other discords i mean I'm, I'm always lurking in all of them and it's very interesting because you get very you you end up having like um i don't want to say clicks but you have like communities of form with personalities to put like you, your community takes up a personality of its own and artists get to find what works for them so for example for me i'm a very like i like blunt feedback i like very you know sort of hard truths and honesty there's one called 3d fast track where like they will shred you. It doesn't matter how good your work is, they'll shred its pieces. Not in a rude way, they'll just be very honest. And then there's other discords like the Dynasty one where it's like, you know, it's um, far more kind of based on just talking to each other and be, yeah, being friendly. I know yours is like that too. It's a very friendly place to be. I think that's the real power for it is you get to find what works for you. Like, because not everything's perfect. You know, there'll be people who will join discords. It's just not for them. You know, the the vibe, the humor, because that's the other thing. When you're talking to people, and you develop soft skills, you learn to give critique, you learn to receive critique. And it's the closest thing to that, sh and I know you'll be able to attest to this, like, you know, like with a studio, you're like, your development's going pretty well, it's linear development. And then you hit a studio, your first studio job, you spike, your development goes through the roof because you're surrounded by good people, surrounded by people who want to help you. I feel like Discord is the closest thing to replicating that. The whole being surrounded by good people and your development being able to spike if you find the right community. Yeah, yeah, I can agree. Uh, and that's, I guess, the, the difference like now, a few years after when I started as well, is that we do have the ability to form small communities on Discord and you will be able to find um, where you think you belong uh, as well. Like compared to before when it didn't exist, you will have to be lurking on one of the bigger forums and it will be hit and miss and some people will be scared off from it and some people you know loved hanging out on the forums so i think uh i think we're in a good um spot when it comes to forming art communities though i also hear that on the other side of the coin is that there are so many that people don't know where to you know even start to find them because they don't want to miss out on the good stuff either so then when it tends to get a lot, it's harder to find the communities you want to engage in as well. So I guess that's the, the downside that <laughs> it's uh, easy to do new communities, but it's harder for people that are new to find these communities mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, it's kind of what, it's a bit what we're missing now with, uh, with since there's no events this year, we're missing that getting together uh, for a few days or a week where you can get to meet people and then you meet them on a personal level, but then um, like on a work level or a uh, skill level, you're able to to give feedback. Once you've established that relationship, that that uh, it, it becomes a lot more different when you're getting feedback from people. THU is an example that I've been to several years and the the emphasis on community building and supporting one another in the in what we're doing is tremendously uh, powerful in creating those bonds that then when you want feedback about your work you feel like you're showing it to someone you can trust and is going to give you honest feedback but in a way that uh that you can receive depending on how you are um are, are there ways that uh that you look at yourself and your skills are there techniques and things you put your um challenges you put to yourself to try to get better like how are you continuing to improve in your uh, abilities? <laughs> That's a tricky question because for me also, like I'm a bit unsure what I want to do next as well. And that is also 
dictating what I want to learn and like what's next. Um, and I think there's a lot of focus on, in particular, hard skills. Uh, and you kind of have to focus on that as an artist as well to, you know, be on par with the uh, <laughs> ever evolving tech that are and stuff. But at the same time, it's hard to know everything as well. So um, I guess for me, when I'm trying to sit down and, you know, what I want to do is that I look at the things that are currently and then, you know, what might be coming ahead. And I find a lot of fascination in workflows and pipelines in general. So I tend to focus more on the way you work rather than the software itself. So um, when I, there is a new software, I try to look at, okay, what is it that you're actually trying to use in here? And is, is that something that is like valid for me that I can add to my pool? Or is that maybe not the right thing that I'm looking for right now? Um, if that answered the question, it's a bit tricky because yeah, even if I do want to learn everything, it's like, it's hard. And in the end, I see all the software is just like a tool. Like if I would be a carpenter, it's just different hammers or saws and stuff like that. So it's more like the technique of what I want to do with like when I have the tool, um, and what it's kind of enabling me to do. So I tend to look at all of the things, uh, feature updates and stuff, and then I'm like, okay, but that in particular looks like an interesting feature. I want to learn that, but then I don't learn anything else in the software because that might be uh, invalid to what I want to do uh, right now. So try to pick the pick the candy pieces that are nice. So I was talking to my friends this morning about something, and I'm actually you, you, you can help probably unpack this a little bit. There's like this is there's this term called the Dunning Kruger effect. Like the the more you know, the more you know you don't know because you're just aware of how big the industry is and you can't know everything. I find we were talking about like you met, kind of touched on it a little bit with the whole idea of um, people being scared to ask questions because they don't want to look stupid or anything like that. And the more I so I've sort of moved away from Discord communities a bit and like sort of hang out with groups of artists sort of a lot around my level and people are a lot more open to ask the stupid questions. They're not, they're not upset about embarrassing themselves. They know they're a good artist. It's just in case they don't, they don't know everything. And they're far more comfortable to just say, okay, you know what? I've just never looked at this. I, I've got a stupid question. Can you just help me? And someone has the answer and they help them. And they learn really, really quickly because they're happy just to, you know what? I'm an idiot. Just can you just tell me what I'm missing? Have you found that as well? Like as you get more experience, you're kind of okay asking the questions that you, you know, maybe if you're a younger artist might be a bit more nervous to ask because you just, it's okay to not know everything. Yeah. I think I always asked stupid questions in general, <laughs> mm. um, because I find it very hard and tricky to learn. I mean, for me, just learning that there are three dimensions in a, a 3D modeling software, that took a while. Uh, and knowing what a UV map was, like I didn't get it until someone started right, you know, <laughs> drawing. Like this is how you skin an animal. Think about it that way. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to think about that, trying to unwrap a, a small little house. Like, um, so for me, it's like I find it always tricky in the beginning to learn anything that is new, and that's always been the case for me when. Uh, you know, I've been in school as well, but it hasn't like put any hinders for me to actually, you know, in the end, learn things and, uh, you know, get very good at them. It's just about, you know, being stubborn enough that, okay, I really want to learn this and not give up. And one of the things that I learned the most from nowadays is to talk to uh, junior artists, actually, because they are asking things that I have to think about as well. Like, huh, yeah, that is true. Why is it? that we do it this way or why is it that it function like this or why do we do certain things in an order or is this really the best way to work or like how can you do this differently and stuff so for me like i find most enjoyment in talking to people who are completely new because that makes my head you know <laughs> start to think about okay how how would i solve this because that's something that I maybe wouldn't have thought about or uh, people who have a lot of experience, senior and stuff, they tend to stick to the pipeline that they know or they're comfortable with and like, oh, I know this very well, so I'm just going to do the same thing. Um, 
while new people, they're hungry for learning. So they will have so many different angles uh, that like sometimes I'm like very surprised that no one have asked the same questions before. So, yeah. That's probably actually one of my favorite things about this industry is that a junior can speak to a senior and teach us like a senior with 15 years experience, a junior on their first day could teach them something because yeah, you know, like I said, software changes so quickly and you know, people will stick to the pipelines they know. I love the fact that A, there's a level of respect, you know, within the industry where a senior will listen to if a junior has, you know, a, an idea of new software or something, we will listen. Like it's always been the case. I just love the fact that a junior can talk to somebody with fifteen years more experience and teach them something they genuinely don't know. I just find that amazing. That's always been like, when I see that happen, even like this, this happened uh, earlier last week with our student, and it's just kind of like, it's great. It's it's a pleasure to see because it just kind of reminds you that everybody has something interesting to share despite the experience levels. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting you said, I just wanted to interject to ask the question for myself. Like, do you find that, that seniors, um, because in some cases they might have always understood the fundamentals that learning something new uh, about a tool or, or or new technology comes faster because you understand the fundamentals or, or not really? I think it can go both ways. I think seniors sometimes can be very stubborn in the way that they've always done things, that they don't want to learn something new because that's, you know, um, why should I? Because this is already working. That sounds, uh, I know, like it takes time. That's usually the answer. That takes time. Why should I learn something new? Um, or it can be the other way that they snap on things immediately because they do have a lot of experience. But I think that's comes in, coming down to personality, you know, like if you like the ever changing fact of things that you always have to learn things, or if you find it tedious that you have to learn something new all the time. Uh, because I, I think also people who have 15 years experience right now they started working when we didn't, didn't have a lot of the technical softwares and they had other technical challenges then. And sometimes they did everything as well, part of a game, like they would do thing, all the things that we now are specializing in. So they have a lot of like broadened knowledge, but they might not have the specific speciality that people nowadays have when they're diving deep into something. And that goes back to like, you can't know everything nowadays. Well, you maybe could almost know everything about there is for, you know, creating a part of the game before, because that was the limitations you had. And now there's so many different things you can do that it's like, you can't possibly know everything. It's impossible. That's we, that's why we do have people who specialize because otherwise, uh, how are we other, uh, otherwise going to tackle these things? So I think it can go both ways. And I met both type of uh, senior people being either very stubborn for changes or being very excited because they want to learn new things. So it's, it's, it's kind of funny though, because when you speak to the, with the stubborn crowd, for example, I, I've met a few like this and actually they taught me something. There was an interesting thing that someone was explaining to me once about the fact that we, over the past, since like procedural tech really has taken off and really become like prominent in our workflows, we do have a tendency to overcomplicate for the sake, sometimes for the sake of doing things. Um, like, you know, um, I mean, we still look at, if you could look at like any of the LA studios, Sony Santa Monica, um, Naughty Dog, they were still scooped tolerables. Like, you know what? There's just some things that the old fashioned way still, uh, I say old fashioned way, but the, <laughs> that it, it, you know, you'll get a better result. Um, or a quicker result where it just gets the job done faster. And it was somebody, I can't remember who it was who explained this to me, but I was arguing the point that, oh, it's, it's just an old school way and you, you know, there's newer, better ways of doing it. And he, his point was complicate, more complicated doesn't necessarily mean better. And I was like, hmm, this is, a, maybe you're right. And then he gave the examples that he did, you know, the LA studios. He says, you don't argue the quality of Last of Us. You don't argue the quality of this and the other. And he wasn't like discounting procedural workflows, but he, his point was don't discount the slightly more old school ways or like the techniques we used 10 years ago. Um, and I mean, he was being stubborn. Like I, I think about it, he was being very stubborn, but it was interesting. It's, it kind of was a light bulb moment for me just to be like, okay, you know what? Fine. I'm going to try and look at this through his lens and you do sort of workflows that they, they sort of slightly more traditional ways. And you're like, yeah, that was 
pretty easy. That was a really easy way of doing it. It kind of it's that light bulb moment. I think people, and I think it's good for people to do both. I think that's the main thing I say to a lot of people these days is try a bit of both and see what works for you. Because for some people, procedural stuff just doesn't click. I, I, you know, it took me years to get a hang of it. For some people, they can just scoop for days and they're way faster than anybody. That's what I found a lot recently as well. I'm trying to be a bit more open to all the kinds of workflows because procedural. It's, I don't know. It kind of fit, like you know, you see stuff like Houdini, and you're like, everyone's it's the buzzword at the moment, the Houdini workflows. And I'm seeing studios pick it up and like you know, really run with it. And I was, an artist would just say, I could have done that in ten minutes in 3ds Max. If you just give me ten minutes, I would have modeled that. You don't need to use Houdini. I'm like, ah, yeah. are you right? I can't work it out. I think like proceduralism is good for certain things, right? Um, it's supposed to speed up uh, certain parts. If it's only used because it's like cool, but it still slows down things, then it's not really worth it. It's the non-destructiveness and like speeding up the same mundane task that you don't really want to spend time on because it's very mundane and the, the software can do it procedurally for you. Um, then it's powerful, but it's just like, as I mentioned like earlier with substance, just because you can do everything manually, from like a uh, flat square in the, to make like a material and it's sure really fun and technically challenging. It's not like we have time to do that in production. It's like, you know, there, there's no way. Uh, there are other methods then that are better. And I would say it's the same with Houdini. Like I wouldn't necessarily go in and model in Houdini, even if you would be able to, but it sounds like a pain to do that. And or you can do it traditionally with your sub D modeling and you're done faster than what you probably could have pursued. Um, yeah, made in Houdini. So for certain things, uh, we should use that so we can focus on other creative tasks, but not for everything, no. But I think that's also, you know, part of the bus. It's cool like right now. Uh, something new is probably going to be the cool new things in two or three years again. And then that's going to be all the things that we're going to, talk about and when I use as well so yeah do you, you mentioned time you know we don't have time to do that sometimes is that something do you, you know being a leader and a principal when you're talking to or you're mentoring because I imagine you still spend some time mentoring some of the juniors or even mids I see have have this issue the whole being attached to your artwork you know like the work you're doing on a job it this this isn't a portfolio piece this is a game you're not making portfolio pieces you're making a game you don't get to do things your way just because you want to do it like you know this mm. is a job at the end of the day do you run into that very much like in your experience not necessarily at this studio but it's in the past or dealing with artists in general i would say that i i run into it in different workplaces but i also get a lot of questions about that but i also think that's i think it's also how people perceive the games industry to be and also going back to the type of education you've probably been part of doing where you might have been doing everything and because you're supposed to learn how to do things and uh, to try out things and you're supposed to fail and then learn it from school and stuff but uh, in a workplace it's uh, different and it's also going to be different working in a game company and working in a outsourcing studio that is also part of the game developing process but I think that's where it might not be very clear especially from educations because we're talking about oh you want to go to Dice or Naughty Dog or you know any other cool uh, studio name and people are like yeah I want to go there they don't really talk about like that the, you can work in an outsourcing studio and do cool art because they are also very much part of the game development. And I think the, uh, the things that students here need to understand is that when you are in a game studio, you're focusing on developing the game and you're a team, which means that even if you're working in the art department, you're part of making a game, not making one asset. You're part of making that experience for the player happen that involves a lot of planning, management, and also iterations and gameplay and you know all of the other things. While if you work in an outsourcing studio, you get an order for a batch of assets, or sometimes you are part of what they call uh, like co-developments nowadays. But I think the thing here that some people will be disappointed with when they enter a big a AAA studio is the fact that there's a lot of these soft skill, skills that require and also a lot of planning and managing, even if you're a junior. 
and that maybe then working in outsourcing studio would have been a better like fit for you if you want to focus on the art production but because people see <laughs> outsourcing as a bad thing people don't want to really work at those studios either but i think that you know if you're are someone who wants to focus on making art it's you know it's still part of making a game but it's just other type of job which involves less management so um i think we That's should change though right that, that whole mentality changing. of it's not good because i think it's changing, was, yeah because i've seen some things happen where like outsource work on something and then it goes to the studio but outsource don't get to claim the credit for it like you know when we took come to post on portfolios mm. and all this sort of stuff because of legalities luckily for the most part i'm seeing like that being called out and corrected because i mean i've watched outsource and it is fun it is really fun where you just i don't have to worry about the technical limitations i just get to make art and it actually opens the door to a lot of people like to a lot of people who wouldn't normally have the opportunity to because they're mainly remote and i you know there's a decade ago, some of our strongest artists were based in, you know, Brazil, Africa, Russia. They were some of our best artists, and they wouldn't normally get the same opportunities to work at the big studios because of relocation or, you know, particular mm -hmm. skill sets. But I was also opened the door to a lot of people. I mean, that's what opened my eyes to it anyway, was I was in the studio in, in Deco, and I'm looking around like, this is one of the most diverse work groups I've ever worked with. And everyone, uh, different age gra grades as well, like completely different, you know, types of people. And they all had the opportunity. And this will be, I'm sure, a great stepping stone if you want to one day work in a studio. Outsource gives you that help of like, okay, I've worked in AAA, I've worked on AAA assets. I can do it. Like, it's kind of like a proving ground almost sometimes for people. Or the other way around, actually, that some people do get into game studios and they find that all well, the managing and the planning is not for me and they move on to uh, work in outsourcing instead like at those studios because that's where they get to be the most creative uh, I mean some people find uh, creativity in doing planning and management as well but some people they don't um, so I've had numerous of colleagues that you know you've been working with in the studio and then they want to go and work for the outsourcing company instead uh, and focus on like doing art and most people that work in uh, outsourcing studios they also tend to get to work on a lot of different projects they're not limited to that studio project they get to work on other studio projects as well so um it's just for me that I think we should talk a bit more about that. You know, there's a whole an another uh, aspect for artists to choose, like when it comes to career options or just workplaces, that it's not just about the game studios. It's like all of the people involved in making a game. It's not one studio nowadays that are making the game by themselves. Usually they have a lot of help from other like uh, partners. So... Yeah, just put, putting it out there. You can look at really cool outsourcing studios to work for as well. It's, it's interesting because I, I don't hear that as much from artists. Um, and I think, yeah, what the, the points that you've been raising are, are pretty valid about uh, why you would want to work at an outsourcing studio versus working at a, a AAA game studio or the studio, um, maybe working on the game that you used to play a lot when you were a, a kid or growing up. Is that is that part of what? Um, so the reasons that you listed are those the reasons why you you've in uh, your recent experience decided to work at large studios? Like you like the planning uh, stage, you like working on one project, you uh, one game. Uh, you have the artistic side too, but you like some of that administrative and and planning side. I wouldn't say that I necessarily like to work on one game only, but I do like the the whole pipeline and workflow process and like how do we actually make a game uh, equally as I like to make art. And I find for me most enjoyment if I do art in my spare time compared if like I do that full time in a studio. So at least what I found now, it wasn't the case when I started, of course, like then I just wanted to make cool art at a studio. But increasingly during time, I have noticed that I rather spend time in doing art that I decide myself that I want to do in whichever art style I want to do, if it's stylized or realism, and then I do that. Um, and then I can focus my effort on other things when I'm working in the studio, like the processes and managing and planning and stuff. I'm thinking about that, managing the process side of things. Has that always come like, has that always been part of what you like to do? Or is that something that's just from working in games? 
because we have to plan everything even if we're just working on a project like if i want to plan a material i have to plan it i have to organize it does that sort of stuff come naturally to you or is it something that's just developed over time like when i started doing things i was interested in why and how we do certain things like why do i need a normal map here can i do it differently uh why would i need to use like um certain types of like inputs in a shader to get this result can i do this differently um is there a way for me to do this cheap but still get exactly the same result as if i would have done it with all the fancy inputs so i like tinkering with things and see if i can get something better out of like the worst case scenario uh for me that's like almost like meditation it's like a you know doing a puzzle uh problem solving so I would say I never considered myself an artist and I still don't really in a way because for me when I was growing up an artist is like someone who draws and can picture something in their head and then put it on a paper while for me I can't really picture anything in my head I, I have to have references and then you know kind of mimic what I see uh, or combine ideas so yeah I would say maybe it's come natural for me to do workflows or um, figure out a different ways of uh, doing things. Um, unsure, but it's something that has increasingly been growing for me, at least that this is something I find interesting as doing as a job and then doing other things in my spare time, I would say. Interesting to have that outlet outside of work where you can uh, explore things and maybe um, yeah, work on something different from what you're working on during the day, but you have that outlet and uh, it's more relaxing. Yeah, I also found that when I was doing mostly art during work time, I wouldn't have the energy in the evenings to do my own art. And that was something that was affecting me personally, like mental health wise. I would feel stressed if I didn't do art in my own spare time, but I didn't have the energy uh, to do it. I was like completely exhausted from spending all that part of, I guess, my brain on doing it on the job. So while I shifted a bit of my work focus to something completely different, tinkering still with 3D, of course, but, you know, behind the scene more, I find that I have the energy in the evenings to then use it as my hobby because that's kind of where it started in the whole beginning. Like making games was like my hobby and then it turned into something I pers like persuaded as like a career. And after years, I kind of missed the hobby part but it's too much to have it as your work and a hobby at the same time. So at least that's the case for me. I see people every day that do both and I don't, <laughs> I don't know how they do it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. It's been great to hear uh, yeah, your experience about, uh, about that and how you've, you found your way there. Um, so there's lots of ways that people can, um, can contact and reach out to you. You have your, your art station, of course, you're also on Twitch, Maybe you talk a little bit about Twitch, what, what you're doing there. and So at Twitch, I'm mostly working on my personal projects. Um, I either do things that I've been asked like by people, hey, how would you model this? Or I just try to learn something new by myself. And actually, most of the time, it's the community that teaches me how to do things. So that's quite uh, funny. So yeah, like that's that's kind of what people can expect. Either seeing me fail <laughs> with learning something new, or if they uh, want to learn something from how I work or how I learn, I guess. Um, the whole Twitch star thing started out with me uh, wanting to um, kind of get rid of my fear of talking in public, and also um, I needed a way of. Um, getting myself back into having it as a hobby. So that was a good thing for me every week, have something scheduled to do it. And then it was just fun. And people said that they had a lot of enjoyment and, you know, learning a lot from it. So that's just been something I continue doing then for, I think it's two and a half year now. Um, you also have, so some of that content you're also putting on your YouTube channel. So if people want to uh, look at some of the tutorials and, and uh, what you've done there, some of the stuff you've worked on, you can visit your YouTube channel. You have your um, your personal website, kimeva.com. Um, people can follow you on Twitter and Instagram. And then um, you're, we've talked about it today, but you're, you've are you set up a Discord. So people for sure should be able to for sure check that out and uh, be part of that community. 
I guess people can find the, uh, kind of all of those things on my ArtStation page because I've linked all of those things there. So if they go on ArtStation and click on my profile, they will find all of those things. Good stuff. Well, thanks so much for your time. It's been really a pleasure to talk to you, Kim, and I uh, hope to have you again on. We can uh, dive more into things. So uh, thanks again. Oh, thank you too. See you on ArtStation.com, the global hub for creative professionals. You've been listening to the ArtStation podcast. Hit subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. And please leave a rating and review for the podcast. We promise we'll read them all. See you next time.